<laughs> we, we, uh, we did this uh, uh, dance uh, four or five years ago. We did. Anne's uh, uh, two sons, uh, uh, one of whom was a Princeton grad, and, uh, and you came down once, I think, talked to his engineering group, and then yep. I was able to, I don't know, somehow uh, fool you into coming a second time and to it's talk great. to my students. Yeah. Um, uh, le le most of you may know Anne, but for those who don't, who, who aren't uh, uh, in the technology sector or the information sector, uh, she's an amazing person to describe. So you can plug your ears if you get a little embarrassed, but, mm. but, but Anne is someone who really started at the, the sharp end of the business uh, in sales, uh, learning what customers uh, want and, and what they need, uh, and went from uh, the sales rep to CEO and one of the iconic companies in the world, of course Xerox, as you know. And look at an, another iconic company, about, founded about the same time, with the same head start, with the same amount of patents, is Kodak. Kodak's bankrupt now. They sold off their last few patents a little while ago. Yeah. And Xerox, frankly, was on that track. I think you had 100, 150 million of free cash, you had 19 billion in debt, and guess what? You're the new CEO. Right. Welcome to the party. Hello. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we'll hear a little bit of how she, yeah. extraordinary story of how she saved that, but I, I just want to position that and of, of long nights, long hours, travel, uh, which we all do in this room, but just an extraordinary story. Yeah. Um, and, and I think sometimes, how do I introduce you? Well, I, maybe I could call you a friend, but, but this as a business leader, uh, you may not know, but she was also um, uh, named by several different organizations as the CEO of the year, CEO of Magazine, unanimously voted by peer CEOs, voted her as the CEO of the year. Uh, Fortune Magazine uh, ranked her as uh, the second most powerful woman in corporate, uh, uh, the corporate world. Yeah. And, and I loved it. So of course, my, yeah, how about that? Yeah. What does that get you? <laughs> right, yeah. But if you're like me, you want to know who's number one and who's number three. <laughs> so number one is actually a friend of ours as well, Indra Nui, uh, right, who's still yeah. the German CEO of Pepsi and doing a terrific job. Her predecessor, Steve Reinemann, is a friend and has been one of our interviewees he's here great. at GLF. And he's, he's just great. an oh, extraordinary wow, he's guy. Fabulous guy. Uh, also anchored, a deep sense of who he is. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't wear his faith in his sleeve, but it's yeah. centered for who he is. Lovely. And number three, you probably never heard of her. It's, um, it's someone named Oprah. Yeah. Uh, Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but maybe you could give her some tips. <laughs> <laughs> so. Maybe change places, right? Be okay too. Yeah. But uh, the last thing I'll say, and then, then let's, let's jump into our yeah. conversation, is uh, we didn't know it at the time, but we probably competed against each other. Uh, I, when she was running a, a, her yeah. first managerial job, yeah. which took you, as I recall, because of sexism, several uh, attempts to get land the job that you, you were given the, the glorious burgeoning territory of Maine. <laughs> exactly, thriving business uh, metropolitan. bed of activity. Oh my God, yeah, yeah. Get to those paper mills up in Presque Isle. Boy, they're, they're fabulous, yeah. And I, I was a young buck at IBM yeah. uh, managing the part of the New England territory, uh, and we were probably competing toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe and never, yeah. never knew it all those exactly. years. Exactly. Here we get yeah, to, yeah. to share a, share a deal. Nice. So. Yeah. So before we jump into business and save yeah. the children, these amazing things, uh, uh, who's Anne Mulcahy, the person? Uh, uh, you grew up in East Rockaway, Long Island, didn't you? I did. So tell yeah. us briefly about your family. So, you know, I, I often say, I think, you know, families um, can be your greatest gift. And I was fortunate in the sense that um, I grew up... Um, you know, very modestly, but incredibly happily and uh, feeling like, wow, you know, it doesn't get any better than this. Four brothers, <laughs> probably not in inconsequential in terms of... And no sisters, right? No sisters right. and uh, the ability to feel comfortable in the business world. So I always view that as a head start, um, an amazing gift. But... Um, you know, parents. Your folks are amazing. Wasn't your mother a volunteer? In yeah, all her life before they had before Braille, they had yeah. um, braille machines. My mom would spend days and days and days um, key punching braille books that hmm. made it possible for kids to actually blind kids to you know read and um, and it was the most. It was an art. It, it actually was and. Hmm. She was just an extraordinary woman, and um, and my dad was totally enlightened. Um, he had ambitions for me that were almost greater than his sons. He felt mm. like it was so important that I ha I felt a sense of um, ambition, and mm. um, so I I 
you know, not from a financial per perspective, but I grew up incredibly privileged in terms of the impact that parents can have on their children in terms of what's possible. So mm. I was very lucky. Yeah. Well, and didn't your dad lucky. also? He pushed at some boundaries because you grew up in a Catholic family, a big Catholic I did. family, I did. right? I did. Yeah. And and uh, didn't he have a little issue with the altar boys? You know, my dad actually had issues with, um, he created this environment where you came to the dinner table every night and you had to have read the newspaper because dinner time was, um, you were gonna debate. You had to be knowledgeable, you had to be come to the table actually prepared to talk about what had happened that was relevant. And, um, and it was, it really wasn't about even the actual article, it was about the controversy. It was about the mm. confidence of having views and having um, opinions about what was being written and starting to create and form you know, your views. And, and that was his whole shtick. Mm. And he would argue and he would be ugly and yell and scream <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I can't you tell you. I can't tell you how many <laughs> nights my mom wound up in the bathroom crying, and oh. it was like, oh God. <laughs> but I, you know, I look at it now and say, um, how wonderful to create that sense of confidence and courage yeah. to debate and have different points of view, and not to just kind of read stuff and accept it. Like the whole point was, read it challenge it, come to the table with a point of view. Right. A, real, a real gift. And wasn't it one of the things he challenged in the Catholic Church that only boys could be altar boys? Oh, totally. Do I remember yeah. that correctly? Yes, yes, yes. So he was, was big on that. He yeah. was um, early on and, um, you know, big on women's roles in, in total, I have to say, although um, I would say my family was very religious, their perspectives were far more about life than mm -hmm. they were about religion. And um, his view was that, you know, his daughter, there was just no reason why she shouldn't have the same options mm. as his sons. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I, I now think about that and say, for that point in time, where did he come from that he had those <laughs> views? Because that was not the, right. you know, the time to be expressing that. But he was extraordinarily progressive and obviously had a huge influence yeah. on me from that. Yeah perspective. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that is a gift because my guess is many of those attributes that he taught you to articulate and to be part of debate stood you well in the years to come. Yeah, you yeah. know, and I've, I, I think one of the things I always have recognized is, is that, you know, you do, if you're privileged, which most of us are, sure. you know, you come to the table with all these gifts. And I think part of our role is to say, you know, how do you then enable an environment with people for people that don't have those privileges and gifts and entrees to actually have a chance to compete and play. Yeah. Well, and as you began competing and playing, as if I recall, it wasn't college wasn't linear. So you go to a Catholic school sort of growing I up. Did. Then you yeah. went to Marymount in Terrytown. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, and, but didn't you take a leave and go to Appalachia or something? I did. I um, so. Every school I've ever gone to is closed. It's the most <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, I have zero reunions to attend. Oh, no. Uh, none, none. You can come and see us in I know, Princeton. I know, we'll yeah. Honor, so, uh, and you're, is that know, orange? I'm not good with colors, but you're yeah, orange but, and black yeah, there. Not intentional, but having said <laughs> that, uh, you know, so, yeah, I have to say that um, I was somewhat unenthralled with the whole educational system and... Um, I went to Marymount, which at the time was very much of a school that wasn't a good fit for me. It wasn't, you know, it was a women's college and it was all about, um, you know, I think trying to fit in with something that really wasn't a good fit for me. So I left and uh, I went and I worked in Appalachia. I created, I had a partnership with Vista. Um, and, um, Almost foreshadows in some ways this chapter of your life. Yeah, long, long gap though. Uh, but having said that, it was extremely impactful in my life. Um, and one of those perspective building opportunities that you have. And uh, it was amazing. So mm -hmm. I spent a couple of years working in Appalachia and then came back and finished college and you know began a, a career. But it definitely stuck with me that this, a passion about 
trying to understand influence and have impact on, you know, this kind of lottery of life thing that happens as to where you're born and what your circumstances are, which is, I think, so amazingly appropriate to be talking about in this room tonight. But, um, you know, that's 95% of the game yeah. is just where you wind up and where you, you know, what your family circumstances are. And um, I, I think there's this compelling opportunity to shift a little bit of that predictability um, in a different direction. Yeah, absolutely. You, we've talked on and off privately and also in public settings about faith and yeah. your faith story or my faith story and everyone has, the, yeah. has their own. And I think you once used the phrase um, uh, that you were uh, um, Catholic by principle but not by practice or, or words that affect. That, t tell us a bit, because my sense is that the, the spiritual part of you, if I could use that language, yes. is, is really wants to be making a difference in the world. It's about doing something. Is that yeah. fair or am I off base there? No, I, um, so yeah, I don't characterize myself as um, terribly religious. Um, By the way, join a lot of people in the world. You're not all alone. All right, so let me go like not religious. And, um, but, um, and, you know, I think sometimes we get confused about the terminology, but I do feel that there's this compelling reason to be values-based mm, and um, mm. to have this strong sense of um, values that guides a lot of how you spend your life mm. and the impact that you have. And, um, and I think, you know, there are a tremendous amount of labels as to how we distinguish that or call it. Um, and I'm not sure that any of that's important, mm -hmm. but um, I do think that there's um, an amazing opportunity to combine the mundane realities of day-to-day -day work life with principles and values that actually uplift and have greater impact that I truly believe in and I think is essential to you know, kind of the purpose-driven life. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you, you may recall, uh, if you dust off this uh, Bible here, that w the, the, the one thing that ticks Jesus off the most that he just rants and raves about is hypocrites. Yeah. People who say all the right yep, words yep. and do all the right things, uh, but then their, their, their reality of their life is different. Yeah. That sort of ticks him off. So yeah. you're, you're in a good, he's going to be happy with you. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. But I, I think that's true across a set of beliefs and I think you yeah, know absolutely. one of the things that would be great for this world is respect for a great diversity of beliefs but not an imposition and um, that we ought to be really comfortable with saying that there is an amazing amount of beliefs that are well-founded that are constructive and you know create positive impact that are not like potentially our own personal beliefs mm -hmm. and um, allowing those to flourish and not feeling this sense of imposition in terms of our own personal set of beliefs. In fact, Steve Reinemann used to always say that, I don't care what it is, but you need a true north. Yeah. And you got to figure out what it is, and it's a very important. It's not an unimportant question. Yeah. But but you've got to have one. Yeah. Uh, because the pressures, the opportunities, the pleasures yep. of life can take us off base. Uh, yeah. So so I, I'm curious as you, uh, we'll, we'll move in and out between talking about Xerox and yeah. say the children because they're obviously two parts. Of, by the way, do you like my tie? I love your tie. This and is embarrassingly, I didn't notice. <laughs> That it was a save the children tie, but the save the children people who came immediately, boom, there we go. save the children tie. And so I just wanted it as a collector's item. It is, about 10 or it is. Old, we don't so. make those anymore. They're, uh, yes, <laughs> money making prospect. It's, here. it's beautiful. Yeah. You know, I don't know if I, I told you this story. My, uh, when our, we have several nieces, when one of them was. Uh, uh, about seven or eight years old, she somehow became aware of Save the Children. Yeah. And she said, uh, we asked, what do you want for Christmas? And she said, well, I want to sponsor a child. And we said, well, that's pretty amazing, seven-year-old. Yeah. And so we'll, 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 our gift will be that for you. And what else do you want? She said, oh, that's all I want. Yeah. I said, you're kidding, seven-year-old. 
So we did that, and every year after that, we'd ask her again, would you yeah. like something else? And she said no, and she actually became a pen pal. I mean, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary story until the, the girl is 18, and she wrote one last letter, and we've lost track yeah. of her, that because of that, her, her parents were able to work. She didn't have to sell herself into, to, to the sex yeah. trade or, or some horrific work condition. Uh, and, and that changed a seven-year-old girl's life. And, yeah. That, that, now, the, the PS to the story is her younger sister said, you know, Auntie Kay, um, Uncle Dave, I think it's great you're doing that for Annalise, but I still want my Barbie doll. <laughs> <So> <laughs> That's right. It takes all of us. Could we do that plus the Barbie doll? Yeah, exactly. yeah, no. But, yeah, no, I think um, it's, you know, the stories are extraordinary, the opportunities to create these connections with our children. I mean, I think one of the huge opportunities we have is to create those connections for our kids hmm. with regard to um, the giving back, the, you know, opportunity to understand the, you know, the rest of the world in terms of how they live. And, but how do you um, do that? I mean, what have you done with your boys? Well, you know, I, I do think that, um, you know, by the way, sponsorship is one of the great opportunities, uh, you know, um, connections with a child from whatever, Guatemala or Haiti, whatever it is, I think creates that awareness that actually can be very special, um, extremely important. Family involvement. Uh, by the way, it doesn't have to be, you know, you know, I'm, I'm involved with the Merton Center in Bridgeport where... Tell us you about know that, what, because that's an extra, it's a special place in your life, isn't it? It is. My husband was, you know, the champion of the Merton Center in Bridgeport, but it's one of those community homeless shelters, right? I mean, it's they, they're kind of hand to mouth. They don't make a lot of money. They, you know, don't raise a lot of money. They they kind of live. It's part of Catholic Charities, is it? It is. Yeah. And um, but a lot of it's just about basic human rights. Um, it's about you know if you're homeless and you are really on the streets, what is it like just to be able to come in and have a shower and have mm. clean clothes and have a meal and it's really fundamental human rights. And, you know, by the way, we sit here in Fairfield County and, you know, we have Bridgeport sitting right there, which has this extraordinary set of challenges associated with it. And, um, you know, man, just bringing your kids to do a, you know, one of the soup feeds at, yeah. Merton Center is extraordinary, but I do think there's ways, but I, I think there's an amazing amount of ways where, you know, NGOs in total, Save the Children Included, needs to find ways to bring in that next generation that really we would love to have engaged, because the reality is the donor population is aging, and um, we've not closed the gap yet on trying to figure out how the next generations really create that connection about how do you give back and how do you create that opportunity. So in some ways, I think that's a family obligation. I think that's mm -hmm. something we should be passing on to our children mm -hmm. and figuring out how do we create that value system in them where they understand that's part of what it means to be so freaking lucky mm -hmm. that you're born where you're born under the circumstances you're in. So try to create a context for them where they have that sense of part of their accountability is giving back. I think, I think that's from well, a you've parental taken, uh, point. Well, you've taken Kevin and, and Michael on some of your trips with SAVE, haven't you? I have. We've yeah. gone places, but um, yeah, and it's extraordinary. Uh, there's nothing that takes the place of your kids actually personally facing the extraordinary circumstances. Yeah. Bill Haber, one of the trustees of Save the Children Board was with me and I think it impacted my kids. We were actually in a group in Nepal of girls that had been taken into manual, you know, labor mm -hmm. kind of and had been seconced, if you will, at very young ages, mm -hmm. eight, nine, ten years old, taken out of school. They're now in labor, certainly sexual abuse and um, we're meeting with these group of kids and they're looking at their watches and because they, they have to get back to get on their mm. shift, mm. eight, nine, ten years old. And my two sons sat there and said, um, 
that for them was just the most amazing experience to see mm. children of that age, you know, with responsibilities and accountabilities and, you know, they said, you know, it was, I do think it was life changing for them. Yeah. It was pretty extraordinary, yeah. Well, and whether, as you say, it's um, Thanksgiving Day working at a soup kitchen, or whether it's something yeah, sustained whatever. or once a year, there's these ways make a difference. But try to figure it out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, maybe it's a good time now. Uh, uh, Jeff or Randall, can you roll? We've got a short little video for those of you who don't know Save the Children, um, other than what you've heard tonight or this tie. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Could you roll that? Is that doable, or does that take a while to get going? And this will give you a little bit of a yeah. sense. I think it's just about a three-minute clip, but I, I want to honor the amazing work that Save the Children do, and Anne and and. Uh, Bill and Brad and some of the team that I've had the yeah. pleasure to meet tonight. Sometimes a lot can be done with very little. And the best investment we can make is in children. To work with human beings from the very beginning of their life. We work in far corner of the world. We provide training and chance for children to grow up healthy. Shamal shibawili shet tis on shakshasem ash polo lamites on shakshases. Todo lo que yo sé lo voy a compartir a mi gente, a apoyarlos y para que, no, para que los niños crezcan lo mejor. We work in far flung, isolated rural areas. We can build small-scale projects with a few families and in the community in general, and then they can have impact on the life of thousands and sometimes millions of children in other places. I believe it's very important to work with children in the early years. You help them to grow into their full potential. Most people know Save the Children as an international organization. Very few people know about the work that we do in the U.S. Investing in children's lives is investing in the future. When the tsunami hit in 2004, we have been here for more than 30 years. We respond to any emergency of scale anywhere in the world. We're unique in that we are specifically looking out for the welfare of children in an emergency. And sometimes those needs are very different than the needs of adults and the rest of the community. It's not just about financial resources that help children, advocacy and policy change. A national government to change their policy around children, that can affect millions of kids' lives. That's why the work of Save the Children is so important. We're there in the communities, working with community members to make sure the kids get an education, they have access to health care, to make sure they're protected from harm. The world is facing many challenges. We often wonder, what's the best we can do to heal the world, to make a better future for mankind. The future of the human race is really in their hands. You know, I'm, I'm reminded when I watched that, one of the, the sentences was, children are the most important thing. Yeah. And weaving our various themes together, uh, yeah. Jesus didn't have a lot of time for <laughs> Sometimes the old folks was, let the little children come to me yeah. to have a faith of a child. Let's keep it simple. And that's, uh, that's beautiful. 24,000 uh, children die a day, is it? Yeah. Who don't need to die. 24,000. Mm -hmm. It's a small town. Things we know how to solve, um, yeah. We talk here about this group about ethics. Uh, some would say that uh, the corporate world is dog-eat-dog, -dog, uh, no ethics, it's just the bottom line. 
ah, but the NGO, NGO world, the, the, the nonprofit world, the church world, the, the, that's, a, that's easy. Yeah. Well, it's not really that way, is it? Uh, no. Tell us a little bit about some of the, uh, what you've learned from the corporate world that you could bring as a leader to the nonprofit world. And, and by the way, your budget's what? It, it's huge. You have 14,000 staff or something? And a big I mean, globally, it's what, now $2 billion? $2 billion operation. And, um, you know, $650 million U.S. Um, so it's, it's, it's big, but... Um, so, so what did you learn from the corporate world that helped you? And what do you think you could learn from the corporate world, the, the nonprofit world, that you could take back to the corporate world that we, when we go back to our companies tomorrow, might think afresh about in our leadership style? Well, you know, I, I sort of start with, like, Good leadership is good leadership, mm -hmm. regardless of where you are. And, um, you know, you bring a set of beliefs and principles that kind of guide you um, in terms of how you think. And, you know, businesses are not absent of missions. I think businesses have missions. And mm -hmm. uh, I certainly felt at Xerox that I was on a mission and um, it was worthwhile. It was important, it was tough. It, you know, lots of difficult decisions had to be made that you know, could be subject to critique for sure. Um, what would an example be of one of your, your toughest decisions, uh, particularly when either you're the president or the CEO at that level in your tougher decisions? That had sort of an ethical flavor to it. Uh, well, probably the most obvious and probably the toughest is when I became CEO of Xerox, we probably had, I think we had 96,000 people. And, um, you know, by 2003 or four, I had taken it to 52,000 people. Hmm. You want to talk tough. Um, that was an extraordinarily difficult set of decisions. It was... You know, you try to do them right, you know, you outsource, you protect, you try to treat people fairly, but you're dealing within a set of business realities that actually do have to guide your decision. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to make money, you have to actually have a, a going enterprise, you have shareholders that have invested in your company, um, there's a whole set of constituencies that, you know, absolutely are important in terms of running a public company. And um, so you want to talk tough. It's yeah. like, uh, you know, make that set of decisions that's required um, to get a company healthy and profitable again. And then you get to grow it again and grow it back to whatever 100,000 people. But um, yeah, it was really difficult. It was not the you know, this was not the ideal job. It was, um, you know, extraordinarily, uh, and I think, you know, that's the thing you think about every day when you're doing your job about, you know, how do you ensure you do the best job for your people, you treat them fairly, you actually make a set of decisions that are fair mm -hmm. and logical and uh, somehow convey a sense of, you know, um, purpose for the organization that makes sense so that you can kind of carry forward and still have people's hearts and minds with you as you continue your journey and um, you know a really tough thing to do and um, didn't you as I recall uh, one of the divisions you you actually launched uh, and ran and then you had to close that one down as part of this uh, which I essentially did. dear friends and I think even it was one of your brothers in that division or was he I'm trying to remember no, I, I did have a brother. I do have a brother who worked for Xerox, but um, but it was it was the di division that I started. It was the personal, that's right, yeah, yeah, consumer division of Xerox, and it was exciting. It was going to be kind of your baby in a way. And yeah, it was going to be successful, but it you know required a lot of investment. We ran into obviously huge liquidity problems, lots of other issues, and it was it just wasn't possible to kind of keep it going and. Um, you know, it, it was, it had to be closed down. It was just a eating um, capital and, uh, you know, we were in a, a potential bankruptcy situation. Um, but I do remember, I mean, part of my thing was is that whenever we did a layoff or whatever it was, an outsourcing or a layoff, um, mm -hmm. 
that I would go and announce it personally because somehow, you did it yourself. yeah, because somehow I think it was important to kind of face people mm. and let them know that you know it's my decision. It is my decision, and uh, I'm not suggesting that it's anyone else's. And I want to tell you why. And it wasn't about them. It really wasn't about any of them. I wanted to kind of make sure they didn't feel that they were responsible. This was mm. bad management. It was bad decisions that led us to a point where we had a lot of ugly consequences from those decisions. And um, mm. so, yeah, I shut down a division that I started, that I loved, that I cared about. And, um, you know, I, but amazingly enough, I mean, one of the, uh, you know, during all these times, um, the amazing source of support I got was from the people of Xerox. They would come up, I, I particularly rem remember that day, standing there and having people actually come up and say, God, we know how tough this is for you. <laughs> it's like, whoa, you know, how extraordinary. So I think, you know, I was always continually inspired by the caliber of the people who worked for the company and, um, and tried to do my best to, you know, maintain a sense of integrity and culture about the company we became, which was very different from the company that we were. You, you said once uh, in, in talking about that, that one of the keys to your turnaround was listening. It's a skill that you've always had. So you had this family roots of learning to debate, but you also yeah. learned to listen and not just shout over people. Uh, talk a bit about that, because I, I think that must have helped your credibility. It helps it inside a company. It doesn't necessarily help it outside a company. <laughs> I don't think there's, there's a lot of um, um, credit that you get um, you tell know, the truth from the taking the time or listening. But the fact is, is that um, we live in a world right now, which is, and it's been this way for a while, the short termism, I think, is a really negative aspect of the business world right now. And interestingly enough, it's, I mean, I love speed. I mean, I love making decisions quickly. I hate, you know, things that take too long. Um, but the reality is, is, is that big companies are complicated mm -hmm. and understanding what the underlying issues are and addressing those is so much more important than just kind of what we actually do a lot of the time, which is, you know, throw short term solutions at problems or mm -hmm. respond to mm -hmm. a very short term set of pressures and quarterly pressures are, are I think one of the most disruptive aspects of the business culture today. They really are. They're, you know, doing, being under the quarterly earnings um, pressure drives probably the most dysfunctional behavior in companies today. Hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I did take my time to kind of do my world tour and listen and try to understand what was really happening in the company so that, you know, if you go to, place your bets and take your shots, then hopefully they're done in a way where people resonate with them. They resonate with the problems and the solutions that they actually see it as something that's meaningful. And um, so I did. I, I took probably a longer than accepted period of time to kind of tour the world and talk to mm -hmm. employees and customers and get a sense of what was happening and try to then put a set of actions in place that didn't necessarily resonate with analysts, but definitely would resonate with employees and customers. And that was the, the core of what I wanted to do. The, um, uh, that, that process, you, you commented once, I think when you talked to my students, that it's maybe contrary to the thought of a powerful CEO, but asking for help is not only okay, you have to do it. Uh, and you said you, 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 you called up Warren Buffett, didn't you, out of the blue for, to tell us about that, and Sandy Weil, uh, yeah, the, yeah. The, the then yeah. head of uh, City. Why did you do that? What, what did you learn from those experiences? Well, I think part of it is, um, you know, I'm a big believer that, you know, your greatest asset as a leader is knowing 
who you are and what you do well and what you don't do well. And I have to say, one of my greatest assets was having a true understanding of what I did not do well. <laughs> and I was totally in touch with that side of myself. And, um, and when I got into the job, I, I, I did. I called upon people in the organization and said, you know, I, I'm, I'm in class, I'm a student, you're gonna have to. And I, I worried about it from the sense of, you worry that people are gonna judge you as being incompetent because you're asking for help. But I've never had an experience of asking for help where it actually hasn't been an amazingly positive thing where mm. people like people that actually admit that they don't know how to do things or they don't have answers. Yeah. It's this incredibly positive experience. Um, so for me, um, that was my that was my thing. I I I wanted to tap every resource that could possibly be helpful. But um, uh, the reality was I was trying to sell a financing business. Warren's company was potentially a buyer. But if anybody knows Warren Buffett, you know you never get a good deal with Warren Buffett. He is <laughs> the cheapest, the worst. You never, ever want to make a deal with Warren Buffett. But we, we talked. I called um, because the teams were like, you know, it's horrible, the conditions are terrible, you have to get involved. So I called Warren Buffett. You know, characteristically, Warren Buffett answers the phone and, um, <laughs> and um, invites me out and we actually sit down and have this amazing dialogue about um, the company. And he basically says, you know, if you're not gonna sell your business you know, for this, you know, kind of dirt cheap price, <laughs> then I'm not really interested in being an investor in your business. And um, he said, but I am interested in your business and what you're thinking about for your business. And, um, and that was the amazing part, the uh, opportunity to actually have Warren Buffett give me counsel about the business. And, um, he turned out to be an extraordinary source of counsel for me. Mm. And at moments where you know, I had hit a wall and felt like that I, I didn't know where to turn, his, and, and I have to say not kind, but brutal clarifying messages about, <laughs> no seriously, I mean this is not a guy that you ever want to do a deal with. He is very, very tough. But, as a result, you get this extraordinarily clarifying perspective about business that was, you know, life-changing for me <clears throat> and gave me such, um, I remember telling him that I was being, you know, drawn in a million different directions. I mean, the banks owned the company. I was talking to all the workout bankers, the investors, the analysts, the press, trying to get everybody to kind of understand that there was a story that maybe they could have confidence in and that was motivating. And he looked at me and he said, you know, you're wasting all of your time. <laughs> no one wants to hear stories. They want to see results. And the only way you deliver results is by working with customers and employees. <laughs> so stop everything else you're doing and just focus on customers and employees. It was extraordinary. It was uh, one of those mm. clarifying moments yeah. that really changed the way I spent my time. You've spoken uh, sometimes of um, moments of truth, or yeah. there's a professor up at Harvard B School talks about uh, defining moments. Um, yeah. Share one or two that you had where, in hindsight, you look back and go, wow, uh, I bet my career on that one. And they could be so, at any point in your career. Yeah. yeah. I think um, they're really important in the sense that, um, and I think I said it to your class, is, is that it's really easy to be kind of righteous about um, ethics and, and values because you're always looking in the rearview mirror and when you're in the midst of them, they're never clear. <laughs> they're always blurred. Um, I can't tell you how close you can come to making the wrong decision regardless of you know, what a good value system you might have. It's just not clear. There are so many decisions in business that in retrospect look clear and at the time 
you know, I kind of always say, I was always just a step away from making the wrong decision. I, I always feel that way, I still do, that um, the healthy thing to do is to be always paranoid about making that wrong decision because those moments of truth come and they're, they're really, you know, never clear about the decisions that you make and, um, you know. Does one still haunt you that you made that you look back um, that just haunts you, you're not sure if you, or maybe you know you didn't make the right call, that you wish you could have a mulligans? <sighs> yeah, I think, I, you know, I think I have a number of those that I, I regret, mm -hmm. that I look back on, whether I missed it and, or was too late or whatever. I do, I do think there are a number of those and, um, you know, I'm, I'm always, um, kind of second guessing sometimes the decisions you make there and and by the way they happen they happen in the nonprofit world they're you know as much as they're existent in business and um, you know I have a gazillion examples of um, you know the ones that you made the right call and you made the wrong call on but um, and hopefully not fatal ones but right. I mean they happen all the time and um, I think we're constantly faced with those and you know sometimes we're just lucky that you know we scoot through and they don't become headlines in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal but I think they're all you know have the capacity um, for being um, those kinds of decisions I remember when I was settling with the SEC, we had a huge accounting scandal. It was, you know, the story of the That's decade, right. literally. Yeah. Um, and I would, I personally went down and negotiated um, with the SEC by myself because I felt like that if I went in person, I didn't bring my legions of lawyers that I would have a better chance of actually saving the company. Because if I didn't get the right set of decisions, we were out of business. Mm -hmm. um, we had to file financials. If the SEC didn't allow us to file financials, You're toast. Th yeah. that's it. It yeah. was over. And um, so I made that decision, by the way, contrary to all of my advisors at the time. <laughs> and uh, you know, I remember sitting there across from the head of enforcement um, from the SEC, and um, and I said to him, you know, I'm betting the ranch here. I'm here. You know, I got everything to lose, but I'm counting on the fact that you actually, that we share something here, that we share a value system that you don't want this big iconic company to go under. I understand you don't want to let us off the hook, but, um, but I have to have this belief system that there is a shared value here. And, um, and he said, or she? Not so much. Oh. And, um, and I have to tell you, it was one of the most sobering moments of my career mm. that um, I, I recognized that I, you know, I was betting the ranch I may have made the wrong decision. I might have been better off surrounding myself mm -hmm. with a bunch of lawyers that created all sorts of you know, contracts and infrastructure. So at the end of the day, it wound up okay, not great, but um, it probably wasn't the right decision. It was one of those naive things that you do because you, you feel this sense of you know, I want to do it my way. I have this belief system. And um, there are times when you're better served listening to the, your advisors and right. the people that know best around you. Well, I have to say, uh, being maybe personal, I think that's the charm of who you are as a leader. Because also when you were announced as CEO, and I think your first press conference, um, uh, you made that, that now famous mm, statement yeah. that, um, unsustainable that we don't have model. a sustainable yeah. business model. Yeah. The stock drops, what, 16% yeah, within exactly. an hour. <laughs> welcome aboard our new CEO. <laughs> exactly, yeah, not so, a welcoming uh, moment. But yeah. you've also yeah. said that that earned you in internal credibility and that mattered. It and did. That paid off. Forget the analyst for a second. Let's talk yes, to yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, I, I do think, um, I've always had this belief that, um, well, the West, rest of the world is kind of looking up and out that um, I have always had this feeling that if you can create allegiance and say, 
you're the person people want to work for, that somehow, at the end of the day, that comes back to roost. That it, um, mm. you know, that that is what makes a difference. And mm. that you may lose points um, with your bosses. You may lose points with external constituencies. But if you truly focus on the people you're there to serve, and I, I think if we all thought about our jobs in public companies, more as service jobs, we'd be better. We'd be better off. But um, that that is a really winning proposition. Yeah. That that's at the end of the day what what can make the most substantive difference in terms of your ability as a company to perform or not. Yeah. And, and and share if you will uh, from Save the Children the ethical dilemmas there. And uh, there's one actually several years ago where you had the possibility to work with uh, and you might want to disguise the facts, but, but you had an opportunity to work with a large religious organization that, yeah. um, frankly, could have brought a, was bringing a ton of money to the table. Yeah. Um, is it okay to share that, or parts of it? Tell about that. Yeah, I think, you know, kind of not sharing the specifics, but um, my Save the Children colleagues will recognize it. But, um, yeah, I mean, Save the Children is a non-denominational organization, non-denominational, and, um, you know, some of the best fundraising happens from religious organizations. I mean, right. that is, you know, fact. And um, we actually had engaged and partnered with a very powerful, religiously oriented organization that wanted, loved Save the Children's work, uh, felt that it would be, you know, a great platform That's for true. fundraising right. and, um, you know. Kind of a feature project, if you will, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, and early indications where it was going to be hugely successful, raise a ton more kind of sponsorship opportunities than we did in our traditional um, way. And unfortunately, um, that organization wound up in a controversy, and it happened to be about gay rights and, um, you know, the recognition of, um, you know, really alternative lifestyles. And it was one of those incredible moments of truth where you sit back and say, who are you as an organization and what do you represent, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of what we represent are kids at risk. And there are a ton of kids at risk that, um, you know, are struggling with, um, you know, alternative lifestyles. And, um, and this is a time where, you know, um, values trumps money and you have to make that call and you actually make the call to say you know this is what's consistent with the values of save the children um, despite the fact that it's extraordinarily painful from yeah. a financial perspective yeah. but um, you know I think you know we we constantly I think have those challenges about who we work with who we partner with um, by the way, even where we invest our endowments, uh, you know, these days, it's hugely important that we kind of don't wind up in the wrong places with regard to, um, you know, the kind of funds and right. where their investments are. Right. And uh, so uh, there's, a, I think, a screen that has to be in place that preserves because reputational risk is the worst risk for a nonprofit organization. And preserving that and making sure that we do our best job to safeguard it and, and um, honcho it in the best way possible is hugely important. Yeah. As I recall, independent, it, part of the issue isn't just the position that organization took, but the fact that it became a controversy and a public controversy, yeah. which then impacted, because if you're part of a, a tainted or controversial story, it's going to kill you. Yeah. Uh, even if you have some sympathy or alignment with that view, it's forget the position you're. It, the controversy will kill yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, fair or unfair, you're right. I mean, it's it's not about that. Um, you know, I think um, we have to be extraordinarily careful, and we've had recent examples. Um, that you know, we're an international agency. Save the Children exists around the world, and. You know, there's a set of norms around the world that aren't necessarily totally aligned with U.S.-based yeah. sets of norms. And 
for us, that is always trying to find that path that preserves the integrity of what Save the Children represents, and yet, you know, do what's right for children and press the envelope uh, to the best degree we can, but also respecting the fact that, um, you know, that we're not the definition necessarily of norms throughout the world. I mean, you know, women's reproductive rights are a great example of that. And, um, you know, country by country, there are very, you know, different ways that's judged and assessed. And, um, and we have to find that path to do what's right um, in terms of supporting, you know, women's reproductive rights, the health generally of mothers and children in total, um, but do that in a way that we don't find ourselves polarizing the issue around the world because at the end of the day, you want to be in the toughest places, being able to have impact and supporting progress for women and children. So becoming a political lights, you know, light firestorm is, right. is just not a good place to be. So right. we, we have to always be conscious of that and make sure that we never compromise our ability to be in the places where we can make a difference and have impact. You know, well, I, I recall you telling, and you may have noticed in some of the, the photos we showed of mm -hmm. you earlier where you were wearing a, 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 a scarf, a, yes, a head yes. garb in an Islamic country. Um, my guess is when you were the CEO of Xerox and you were in some of the countries where you have clients that were Islamic countries, I'm going to guess that you didn't wear that. I did not. That you came in as a strong individual person, a strong American woman, a female, yeah. and you're not going to kowtow or play game. You are who you are, and they got to take it or leave it. Yeah. Uh, but I see that, and I, why did you make that decision to put this on now? Well, and in fairness, um, the venues that I was at with Xerox, there's very little overlap with the venues that you're, right. you're at with Save the Children. So, you know, if you're in Islamabad at a, a business conference, not quite the same as being right. in rural Pakistan visiting. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I had that conversation. Um, with Save the Children when we made one of our first trips. And, um, and it actually, I think it was to either Afghanistan or Iraq. Iraq. Or, I think it was Iraq, you said, yeah. Iraq, I think. And, um, and I remember having the conversation, well, you know, I don't need to do that. And very politely, I was told, um, well, <laughs> this isn't staff. about yeah. you. <laughs> this is actually about the people that you're with and respecting these are people who work within cultures that um, you know we live within, and we have great relationships, and um, so we're being respectful of their cultures, and uh, our expectation is is that you know that's the way we work, and and it was a, a huge shift for me in terms of uh, you know okay, it's not about me, <laughs> interestingly <laughs> enough. And that, no yeah, it is, um, it really is about now the work. And it's about facilitating the work and the outcomes. And, um, and then, you know, all of a sudden, none of that made a difference any longer about how you dressed or, you know, what the circumstances were. And one of the great things about Save the Children with regard to security is, is that, um, you know, the greatest security of all is being invisible. And I think Save mm. the Children does an extraordinarily wonderful job of that. When you travel with Save the Children, you're a local. You're not a, you know, visitor. There's no, you know, crazy. I, I now realize that I was in far greater danger at Xerox in the armor-proofed, uh, you nice. know, vehicles with the police lights and all the stuff that went around versus the, you know, beat up SUV that I travel in, you know, in local garb and you are far safer. So the safety of um, being local and appreciating that and respecting it is, is really important. Yeah. yeah. Well, safety of your, your, your coworkers, uh, yeah, the children too. Yeah, absolutely. And the agenda, the goal is different. Yeah. I want to ask, uh, you reflect on one story and then we'll, we'll, we'll draw ourselves to a close, but you told, when you were, if I recall correctly, when you were appointed to be the president of Xerox, uh, there was a very senior officer uh, who was a male and refused to report to you. Uh, tell us about that story. Yeah, yeah. It, um... And by the way, where's the, 
the female power table back there? Holly, <laughs> where? All right, here we go. Yeah. And you know, interestingly enough, I, I sometimes reflect. I mean, I, I went into the workforce in 1974, so there were lots of probably moments where, you know, you confronted issues in the workplace and, um, and you have to make the decision about how do you deal with it? You know, do you make a fuss? Do you sit there and just let it go? Do you, you know, how do you deal with it? And I remember in this particular, and this was, I was very senior at the time. This was two jobs away from becoming CEO. And it was just kind of extraordinary to me that somebody would say, I can't work for you. And, um, and by the way, kind of phrased it as a, I would feel demoted <laughs> having to work for you. Ouch. Um, and wow, I mean, just extraordinary. And at the time, you know, I, I was working for a pretty enlightened CEO, I mean, who had sponsored my career and helped me enormously. But this was a very talented individual, I have to say, extraordinarily talented person. And um, so, you know, for me, the answer was very clear, right? Um, <laughs> okay, either report to her or you go. Mm -hmm. And um, a different decision was made. It was, it, the decision was made that this individual would report to the CEO and I would take the balance of the <laughs> reports. And, um, and I remember, going home that night and um, saying to my husband, I have to quit. This is absolutely unacceptable and um, you know, I, I, I can't allow this to happen. It, you know, it sends a message that this is okay. That, and uh, my husband, person? which who was so wise, said to me, and who benefits from that, you know? <laughs> You're out of work. <laughs> You know, they all continue on, as good as you are, they'll continue on, and quite frankly, in a relatively short period of time, um, nobody's gonna remember this as an issue. And um, he said, I'm not sure that that's the way you wanna play this one. Mm -hmm. um, I think you ought to just play it out. I think you ought to rise above it. I think you ought to make your message known to the person who made a very bad decision rise above it and play this thing out and see if you can't win, even though you've lost in the short round. And I mean, incredibly great advice, obviously. Um, and I did, I went into the person who had made the decision and I said, you know, here's what I have to say. <laughs> there are moments of truth in life and you just failed a big one. <laughs> but I'm going to let it happen and I'm going to do my job and we're going to go on and we're going to run this company and um, I hope we can all overcome it. And, um, and 24 months later, I was CEO. He resigned the day I became CEO. <laughs> bye bye, Charlie. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think about it, it was such a great example of sometimes, you know, sometimes you just can't win. You gotta play things out and see if eventually yeah. things don't work out the way they should. But yeah. anyways, it was, uh, yeah, it was a tough moment. Wow. Let me, uh, my wife, uh, Karen, who can't be here because she, she has MS and uh, she wasn't able to travel tonight, oh. but she used to be a, a, an attorney with Skadden Arps, and, and so I've learned uh, some of uh, uh, some things from her over the years. First of all, never have a, a marital debate with your wife if she's a Skadden Arps lawyer. Not a good idea. You will lose. <laughs> that would be good. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, but uh, let me ask you the due diligence question. And back mm -hmm. in my M&A days, and when I was in a little private equity firm, um, the last question in due diligence is, uh, what should I have asked you tonight about faith? ethics and leadership that I didn't what should I have asked you about faith ethics and leadership that I didn't that might be a nugget for us to take away well you know I think um, what we don't what we didn't talk about was 
how it displays itself in the workplace and or if it does mm -hmm. and you know I, I actually think it's kind of an important message because um, it's not about um, and, and I put it into more of the kind of values and ethics piece of it because I view religion as being very personal mm -hmm. and it's not I don't, I don't think you bring the institution to the workplace. It's, it's not the place that you bring it. Um, so then it becomes more about, you know, really ethics and values. And, um, and I think one of the things that is hugely important is, is that, um, that somehow our actions, it's, it's never about the words, it's never about, the, the dialogue, it's always about the actions. It's about what we do as leaders that actually demonstrate, um, you know, the ability to create that culture of ethics and values that you want in companies. Because at the end of the day, that's the kind of companies our people, people want to work for. It's your kids want to work for companies that actually are more than bottom line results oriented companies. They want to work for places that actually um, treat people fairly, um, have a sense of values that actually get demonstrated day in, day out in the decisions that they make. They want companies that have an impact beyond the bottom line. They want companies that you know, are involved in their communities, they're involved in their world. Um, and I, I actually hope that that notion of how we behave, not what we say, but how we behave, becomes a lot more attractive and compelling in terms of, you know, you want to talk about the 100, the, the, the 100 best places you want to work in America. I kind of hope maybe that's definitional about what becomes attractive about the workplace in this country. And, um, and I think we need to you know, hold companies accountable for that and create expectations with regard to it. And it clearly is about um, a demonstration. It's about actions that actually align themselves with a set of values and beliefs that you know, create um, companies as good corporate citizens. And, um, you know, I think we have this huge opportunity to kind of uplift the way, you know, what companies hold themselves accountable for in general mm -hmm. that um, would make companies much more attractive places for our young people to want to work at. Because right now, I don't know about your kids, but my kids don't want to work for big companies. They don't find them all that compelling and attractive and interesting and I mean they all want jobs but we want them to actually have a passion and an interest in where they want to work and and to have this sense of you know mission even in public companies that they're working for someplace that um, has impact and you know beyond just financial returns so I think it's the thing that I find really appealing about this discussion is, is that I think it, it creates expectations for corporations um, to have um, a much larger impact that they're capable of having right. if we raise our game in terms of um, you know how we behave. So that's terrific. Great. And how about a round of applause, Brandon? Hey, thanks. Stay here a second longer. Don't leave it. <laughs> But uh, you might all remember Jim Collins, Good to Great, and uh, sort of his iconic texts. He, he talked about level five business leaders, level five business leaders, and they had three attributes. And I think we've, we've heard them w with Ann tonight. Le le level five leaders were the ultimate leaders who created value, sustainable value, and, and satisfactory performance over the years. And one of the attributes is, is that they were um, very goal-driven. They had a telos, they had an aim, they had a vision, they knew where they were going. 
They knew where they were going and they articulated it all the time. The second attribute is that they were humble. They weren't the rock star CEO, I want to be in every magazine, I want to be applauded for how wonderful I am. They were always the kind who would ask for help, who would, who would listen, who would ask questions. The humble CEO, not a manufactured humility, but I know I'm embarrassing you, but, but a genuine one. The third attribute, so goal-driven humility, and the third was they were tenacious as heck. <laughs> they were not a bunch of wimps. And growing up with four brothers, you learned how to play hardball? I learned that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so being tenacious and humble are not antithetical. They're, in fact, the style of extraordinary leaders. Um, uh, so I, I want to thank you for that you. And, and this open conversation. So again, have another round of applause. So. Great job. Yeah. Great. Great.